Absolutely. So our company, what we've chosen to do, and, and um, you know, when you're starting your company and your focus is, is absolutely critical to, to make sure you get something done, get something important. Um, but saying that, what we've chosen to do is, is take a vision around the technology, the broader technology, and we're chasing what we think are major trends in the industry with that technology class, and we're applying it in a couple, couple different areas. And so there's a little bit of a, a defocusing now almost where we're chasing different different product brands um, that have a lot of technology synergy but look quite different when we go to your customers. One chasing after drug companies, the other chasing after a uh, large number of researchers. But it's been to our benefit where um, you know, we were making decisions <coughs> say 14 months ago and actually probably picked it wrong, which product I thought was going to be more successful more quickly. Uh, and so with that little bit of diversification has been to our benefit. Um, and then also you're you know you're building a company for the long term. We see the company, we see it, the 500 people that are going to work there 10 years from now, and that's going to require this depth of expertise. So, Simon, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I mean, it is the question that uh, I'd say most smaller companies and, and large companies too would deal with. Um, I think it just comes down to how you define focus. Uh, and so f I think has, has what has resonated from some of the comments is focus can be around a core technology. Um, and so from our point of view, we have focused around an application ability to go out, find these genes in these extreme forms of human disease. Um, and from that has come multiple potential therapeutic opportunities. So we, while we have programs targeting pain, targeting uh, cholesterol disorders, targeting epilepsy, we still see ourselves as a focused company because the focus and the core competency that we've built around identifying these, these targets you know, have lended, has lended itself towards these multiple opportunities which in and of themselves also provide the revenue generating opportunities for the company. So it really just is a matter of how you define that focus. It's not necessarily that it's all in a cardiovascular disease, as an example, or all in a certain, you know, it, it, we, we've defined focus as a core competency that's now yielded opportunities. Great, great. One of the other things that I've heard, um, most of you mentioned is there, there's no playbook. You know, you can't go to the, the library and read, let's read, I don't know, Andy Grove's book or Guy Kawasaki's book or, Know, whatever I'm sure you've all read many books about other entrepreneurs and other managers and leaders. Um, one of the chal big challenges in this business is adaptability over time, right? So you're developing your therapeutic or your device or your diagnostic or your product, and it, you're constantly learning. You know, none of us have it all figured out today exactly where we're going to be five years from now, uh, because there's going to be new science, there's going to be new markets, there's going the flavors change, the power, the convergence of computing and biology, all of these things, the power of genomic analysis, uh, all, all impacting all of how you, all, all of you on this panel, manage your businesses. So, so talk to me a little bit about how you deal with adaptability. Like, what are the signals of when you have to change? Uh, how do you manage that? How do you sort of, you know, if, how do you turn the ship? How do you, how do you keep both the focus and recognize that, hey, now's time. There's some obvious things that happen. Hey, this product failed. It's you know failed in a clinical trial. It's done. There's no recovery from that in you know, a phase two or phase three trial. But there's a lot of little battles along the way uh, where things change and uh, on in many different aspects of your business. So, so Ali, if I if I could start with you and just talk about adaptability in, in your business and and how how you respond to how you anticipate how you respond how you deal with that how you manage your team in that. How you your customers, your financing sources, all of those different key aspects of your business as you're journeying along to success? Well, um, in our case, I think maybe it's, it's a perfect example for this. If you look at the name of the company, the name of the company is Zymeworks, and uh, we started wanting to be an industrial enzymes. As a matter of fact, the very first deal we ever signed was with Warehouse, the, the, the Forest Products paper company, uh, actually enabled with one of the folks that is here uh, today. Um, and I believe adaptability is, is huge and not <coughs> as everybody has probably has said already today, if you kind of go 
this is my single idea, or this is the only way I'm going to do it, you're probably going to fail. Uh, we started as an enzyme company, and we saw that there was no real market opportunity that you know returned values that we wanted for our shareholders in the industrial enzyme business. So in basically around 2008, we had to tell all of our shareholders, all of our employees, and the entire market that we were shifting from one form of a protein being an enzyme to another form of a protein being an antibody. And so long as, back to something Simon said before, so long as your science and everybody else said, uh, if your science is straight, you are you're, you're not hand-waving, you've got a plan, um, people will go with you. Uh, they will see in the logic and uh, you know the path will continue. But it is very difficult because you have to shed your image and you have to be able to present a new image and have people buy into it and go along with it. It's taken us very many years and we've had to do deals like we did with Merck and, and Lily to, as part of that, change. Uh, we didn't change the name because we like the name, but it's, it's part of the game. Thanks. Uh, Andre, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, on adaptability along the way? Yeah, we, we've been through it in space. I mean, if you, <coughs> I mean, we've talked about everything from forensics to uh, cancer and what we've been going after. So we've had to change the direction multiple times. And, uh, you know, it affects the customers, it affects the people in the company, and I think there's also tough times in a company where you have to, uh, you know, abandon projects you're working on and put them on the back burner or start a new project. And, um, it's tough. I mean, I think one, one of the things I wanted to mention, uh, and this actually gets back to success and, and so forth, and for, for me, one of the key things about L'Oreal has been culture, right? Uh, culture of, of the uh, company, of the people working in the company. And adaptability comes easier, I think, when we've got a good culture. And, you know, I, I've had differences of opinion with, um, well, actually, even our sort of management team on this. When, when I started Boreal, whenever we needed to make a decision, uh, I'd pull everyone in the room and we'd chat about it. I mean, everyone uh, that was in the company. Now, that was, you know, doable when it was 12 people. It gets harder when it's 50. Uh, but even then, I think it's important, you know, if you're going to change directions in the company, going to, um, you know, have to make some tough decisions. I, I, I'm not a big proponent of making those at the management level and just handing them down without much explanation. You know, I, I think it's a discussion to have with every employee in the company. They're all shareholders. They're all invested. You know, their jobs depend on where the company's going. And um, what I've found in the past, those those shifts in direction become, become pretty easy. You just have to sell it. You have to sell it to the company. To everyone from, you know, whoever's at the front desk or manufacturing or, you know, uh, to the sea level folks. Um, and then it's not so bad. Um, and it's blocked back on. Not only not so bad, it makes you positive, because often you're making shift in directions because you, you, know, you found a better opportunity or, or you figured something out that, uh, that you need to go after. So um, I think that's, you know, and the same thing goes with customers, to be very honest with them. You know, we, we started this cancer product as an instrument of reagent sale. Uh, we, you know, a year and a half ago, we said, okay, we're going to sell this box to, to a research market. And we figured out six months later that, wait a second, that's not the right business model for us. We, what we really want to be doing is actually uh, working with providers like Platform Quest and so forth and, and internally and, and provide a test ourselves. So after having, you know, half a dozen machines in the field, we have to tell our customers we're no longer selling these machines. Um, and you know, having an honest conversation there just really helps. You know, and, and going out of your way, obviously, to, to you know um, follow up on your promises to those customers without you know endangering the company anyway. Um, so I think that that's actually gone um, uh, gone quite well. Uh, but I think it requires just a, a lot of people skills, a lot of uh, yeah. uh, honesty as well. Great, thanks, Eli. What what, what about adaptability and Journey that your company has has taken. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We, we've been pretty focused on on, on the prostate, the prostate market, really understanding that. Right? We know everybody now. Uh, we're all people that we need to know. And we're pretty much working with all of them. But on, I think on the commercial side, so it hasn't been what we're selling. We know that. Thank you.
salespeople uh, they're good at selling things outside the world, but also internally involved in selling uh, concept or idea, and it can be really, really bad. And you don't you don't really have the especially when you do science big you don't really have the background <coughs> round of financing in uh, January 2008, and uh, the market <coughs> didn't do so well after that. And, uh, and it went on for a long time. Didn't it feel like it went on for a long time? We didn't expect it to be that way, and so we needed more money as we went along, and also the companies that we were planning to do deals with, like Quest, for example, or their, um, their pure companies, everybody was tightening their purse strings, right? Nobody spent, was doing partnerships, and so we're in a deal drought, which is what we told, you know, we told our shareholders, oh yeah, you know, if this technology is good, we're going to get a deal done by then, it's, we're going to do a deal by then. The technology turned out to be good, and we couldn't get the deals done because nobody was doing deals. Uh, talk about adaptability, and uh, you have to, you know, re, actually, my saving grace was, you know that whole stay calm, and whatever. I saw this uh, uh, cover, I can't even remember which magazine it was, but it was stay calm, and innovate. And I thought, oh my God, I think that's a good sign. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. And thank God IRAP was there because IRAP had funding when shareholders weren't, you know, putting any money out. Nobody was doing deals. So that's what we did. We used IRAP funding to help us bridge it. That's adaptability. We didn't expect to have to go that route as aggressively as that. Uh, and we just stayed calm and we innovated. And actually, our four other products and our four other patents are all since 2008. And so it's a bit of a saving, you know, it's silver lining as much as it was very difficult and uh, extremely stressful. And I just want to go back to the seat, to the, your financing question way back because we never went venture capital. All of our financing has been through friends and family. And let me tell you, having a glass of wine on Friday night was never good between 2008 and 2010. <laughs> Everybody in our family and friends was invested in this company, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was why we couldn't get a deal done, or you know that we might need to raise another round of financing. So you know, there's a lot of uh, pressure, and you really have to always look at where is the silver, what is the silver lining, what are we doing, what are we uh, t to weather this challenge? What is it that uh, you know, what is the plan and communicating it honestly so that people uh, buy in and stick around. You want them to stick around when you're shifting gears. Yeah, 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 thanks. Yeah. So James? Uh, yeah, so I would say, I guess, a couple things. One is that uh, you need to have confidence in what you're doing uh, over the long term. So um, you know, we participate in this very volatile area, one of our businesses in, in the RNA space. And so when, when Big Pharma pulls out, pulls back in every other week. You, know, you have to be confident that you believe in that science and that that's a good place to, to be in uh, and keep, keep pursuing that because your investors or your potential investors will like to tell you otherwise, right? Um, but then secondly, you know, the reason why you want to be in this business and in the life sciences uh, as an entrepreneur or you know, in companies and so on is, is the tremendous opportunity that, that is out there right now. So, you know, whereas business is the physics and computers is last century, life science and, and health is, is this century, and, and it really is coming true. And so you need to be um, seeing that things are changing so quickly, and with that, new opportunities arise. So really being able to capitalize on new opportunities that come up is also tremendously important. 